Hey folks! Okay, well today I want to talk about the heart and soul of Lisp. So, recursion is the absolute lifeblood of Lisp. Almost all forms of repetition are driven around the idea of recursion. Right? Even most of the loop functions were originally implemented in a recursive fashion. So, we want to talk about issues with recursion and see if there's a way to address some of them. Alright. So, the typical, the typical setup that you're going to go through when you're dealing with a function in Lisp that's going to be recursive is to error check your parameters, right? Do the type checking, do the, the checks for invalid values, out of range values, all that kind of thing. Check for the base case, the stopping condition for your recursion, and then handle recursive cases. So, pretty straightforward. Our big concern is in the efficiency, both time and memory, for recursive solutions to problems. And what we're going to do is look at what's called tail recursion, a special structure for recursion that can address some of those efficiency issues. So we'll start off and take a look at just a real basic recursive function. So in this case, it's Lisp, so we'll play with lists. So what we want to do is have somebody give us a list of values and we're just going to pick out and return the smallest integer in the list. So what we'll have it do is skip over anything that isn't an integer because, you know, if somebody gives us a list that's got a bunch of garbage in it, then we want to skip those. If they give us a list that has no integers in it, then what we'll do is just by default we'll return the biggest possible integer that the Lisp can handle. And otherwise, again, we'll pick the smallest one that's in the list. So the structure we'll come up with is pretty straightforward. First, we'll, so we've got our function that's going to be smallest. They give us a list of values. Again, we have to do our type checking, so if it's not a list, we'll just bail out and return nil. If it is a list, but it's empty, that's when we'll just return our default value. Eventually, with the recursion, we could wind up here if the list contains no integers. So, by default, we're just going to return the biggest possible integer there is. So there's a constant defined in Lisp that's most positive fixed num. So that's basically just the biggest integer. So, our default will be to fall back on that. So what we want to do if somebody gives us a list is the first thing is we'll check the front element and see if it's something we should look at or not. So if the front element, right, we know there's something there because we've already checked for an empty list. So we'll check the front element, right, car is, car of L is the front element. If it's not an integer, then we'll ignore it and just do a recursive call and say, okay, we'll find the smallest thing in what's left. So find the smallest in the tail of the list, right, the cutter of the list. If we get past that, we know the thing in front is at least an integer. So now what we'll do is see if what's in front is smaller than whatever is in the rest of the list. So we'll do a recursive call, get the smallest number from the rest of the list, and again, if the rest of the list is garbage, it'll give us back the biggest possible integer. And if there's something valid out there, it'll give us what's smallest in that. So then we'll compare the smallest thing from the rest of the list to the front element and return whichever one's smaller. Or, pardon me, if the, uh, if the one in front is smaller, we'll return that. And then if we get past that, then the thing in front isn't the smallest. So we'll go through and just find whatever's smallest in the rest of the list. So it's possible that we're going to go through and here we're doing our recursive call and deciding, oh, the thing in front isn't smallest, so we're doing our recursive call again and figuring out what's smallest. Now, it works. We'll run through an example in just a second. It works, but there are some kind of typical efficiency issues with a nice simple solution logically like this. So if you think about it, in this particular case, if we're going through and saying, okay, well, let's see if what's in front is smaller than the re anything in the rest. So this one's going to go off and find out the smallest thing in the rest. Well, we're not going to do this test until after this thing has completed. So 
this recursive call then might have to go through and see if its front element is smaller than everything else in the rest. So it's going to go off and do everything again. If what's in front is actually not smaller, we're going to wind, off, wind up going off and doing this whole thing again in just a moment anyways. So we can wind up going through and calling smallest an awful lot of times, and so we're going to get this fairly slow behavior. Let's just run through and we'll uh, take, a look at the, take a look at this in action just to confirm that what we're thinking is actually true. So what I've got here, um, did I actually call it smallest? Woohoo, I did. Okay, so what we've got here is our smallest function. So this is the same idea I just threw comments in. So if it's not a list, bail out. If it's empty, just return the default biggest possible integer. If the thing in front isn't an integer, find out the smallest thing from the rest. If the thing in front is smaller than the smallest thing in the rest, return the thing in front. Otherwise, return the smallest thing in the rest. So all I've done in addition is to throw in a print statement at the beginning so that at, each, at the start of each call, it shows us the call that's being made. So we can kind of watch how often this thing gets called and on what. And then what I'm going to do is I'm going to make this an executable script. So I'll just have it start by asking the user to enter a list, read it in, and then call the function and print out whatever the result was. So if we run smallest, it asks us to enter a list. So let's enter a list where the smallest thing is the very last thing. We're going to enter this in, if you like, reverse order. So make it the worst case we can for this particular algorithm. So it's got to go off, and it goes through, again, a pass, seeing if the, if the 2 is the smallest thing, and it winds up doing all these recursive calls, and then cycling back and seeing, okay, for the, the other half of the list, let's find out what's going on. You wind up with whatever we've got here, five calls, five recursive calls for a two-element list. We add one element, and now we're, how many have we got here? Two, four, six, eight, ten, eleven calls for a three-element list. It's getting the right answer. Oops. How about I actually wait until it asks me? Uh, four, three, two, one, try four-element list. And you can see that our number of calls is increasing quite dramatically. 2, 4, 6, 8, 10, 12, 14, 16, 18, 20, 22, 24. So we're more than doubling here. So actually, let's, uh, let's make life a little easier on us. Let's try. So I'm going to run smallest. Oops. I'm going to run smallest.cl. Uh, I'm going to take its input from a string, so I'll take advantage of a little bit of bash here. 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. So it'll take its input from a string and it'll send its output to a word counter. So this is basically just going to run the program on the list and tell us how many lines of output there were. So 49, essentially 48 recursive calls for, uh, or I guess maybe 47 recursive calls, for a five-element list. If we make it a six-element list, you know, we're pretty much doubling the amount, the number of recursive calls we're making every time we add one more element to the list. So our efficiency is pretty darn bad. And you get the idea that if we... Uh, Let's get to a uh, longish list here. Let's go to 20, 19, 18, 17, 16, 15, 16, 14, 13, 12, 11, 10. So let's go to a, uh, I guess actually a 20 element list here. And it's gonna take a long time. Maybe I should have gone with something slower or something smaller. So it's gonna take a long time and it's chewing up a whole lot of memory because there's a lot of recursive calls active at any given point in time. And so we've got lots of issues. This is a good example of just how uh, the kinds of problems we can run into. So there we get a look at the number of recursive calls that we made or the number of function calls that we made for a 20 element list. All right, so this is pretty ugly.
clearly we want a better solution. So what I would like is to find an efficient solution that's still recursive. And that's where we're going next. All righty. So we've got the problem of time, right? Just the sheer number of calls that we're performing. And we've got the problem of stack space, right? Every recursive call generates a new stack frame. And if you've got deep layers of recursion, you can eventually wind up using up all your stack space and having the thing crash. And even if it doesn't crash, you wind up using a ton of stack space. So what we want is a way to structure our recursion that doesn't use all of that stack space. So even if it does a lot of recursive calls, it doesn't wind up using the, the stack space. And of course, we also want to provide an algorithm that uses fewer recursive calls. So what we're going to take a look at here is called tail recursion or tail recursive functions. And we're going to re rely on having a compiler that can recognize when something's tail recursive and perform optimizations to take advantage of it. So first off, we'll look at the definition of tail recursive. We'll call a function tail recursive if and only if the result of every recursive call gets immediately returned. There's no processing after you make a recursive call. That recursive call, the result of that recursive call is what you actually return. So we'll take a look at a couple of examples to get the, uh, the idea. So in this function, we've got some function f and it's going through, what's this doing? It's, oh, it's uh, taking a uh, parameter. If it's not a number, we bail out. If it's a negative number, then we're gonna compute um, f of the absolute value essentially and if it's uh, smaller than one but positive we'll take the uh, we'll invert it and otherwise we'll go and make a recursive call and otherwise we'll just compute the square root so we're trying to get the square root of a number that's bigger than one eventually but the uh, the point of f isn't so much about its what it's doing the point is about whether f is tail recursive or not. So we've got two places where f makes a recursive call, right? Two places where f calls itself. In both of those cases, what f does is it makes the recursive call and immediately returns the result of that recursive call, right? If it makes this recursive call, it doesn't do anything afterwards, it just returns it. Similarly here. If it makes this recursive call, it just immediately returns the result. So this is a tail recursive function. To give an example of things that aren't tail recursive, if there is at least one recursive call where you do something to the result afterwards before returning it, then it's not tail recursive. So here we've got a function f, um, same idea, and we've got a recursive call that it actually returns the result immediately. So this one's okay, right? We call f and immediately return whatever f returned. But this one here, we've got a recursive call to f, but then once f comes back with an answer, we multiply that answer by 10 and then return that. So we are not just simply returning whatever f returns. So this one is not tail recursive. There's something in here that makes it not tail recursive. All right, so who cares? Why does tail recursion matter? Well, it all comes down to our use of space on the stack. So essentially, in a tail recursive function, once we make that tail recursive call, the space that's set aside for the current stack frame is never ever used again, except for the, the space for a return value. And that space, the only purpose it serves is that we'll copy the value from the recursive call to there and then immediately return that. So let's take a, a bit of a look at that idea. Um, so this is just kind of a, an outline of the idea that we've got. Suppose we've got some recursive function foo. So we'll have an original call to foo and on the stack frame or in the stack frame for that call you'll see space for a return value, space for the local variables, space for the parameters, right? There'll be a bunch of things set aside in there. And when it makes the recursive call, 
it sets up a new stack frame that's going to have space for its parameters and local variables and space for its return value. And when that makes a recursive call, right, it's going to set up another one and make set up space for its parameters, its local variables, its return value, whatever else is in there. And then as the recursion completes, this stuff unwinds, right? As the, the last recursive call completes, its return value is copied to the function that called it. And again, if it's tail recursive, all that's happening to this return value is that it's immediately getting copied and used as the return value for that middle recursive call. And when that one gets returned, the only thing that's going to happen to it is it's immediately going to get copied as the return value here, and this one's going to return. So what's actually going on is once that original call makes its recursive call, so after it calls the, the next iteration of foo, nothing in here is ever used again except the space for that return value. And it's only used as sort of a temporary landing spot for the return value from the recursive call. And then the same thing with the other ones, right? With that middle call, if you like. Once it makes its call to the last version of foo, none of this stuff is ever used again. None of its stack frame is ever used again, except for the space for that return value. And again, that's really only used as kind of a temporary landing pad for the return value from the recursive call. So what's happening is once we make our recursive call, we're never using this stack space again. Why hang on to it? So the idea is, in a tail recursive call, what we could say is, oh, well, if I'm making a tail recursive call, then I don't need any of this space anymore. I can just overwrite this stack frame with what I would have used for the next one. And the return value is going to land in the exact same spot. Actually, the parameters and all that kind of thing are going to land up in pretty much the same structure. So really, what we're going to wind up doing is when we make a recursive call, say, OK, we'll replace this, the spot where I've currently got A, replace it with the A I'm using in the recursive call, the place where I've got B, replace it with the B I'm using in the recursive call, etc., etc., etc. So all we have to do is overwrite the values in our current stack frame and just keep using this stack frame over and over and over again. So this, in this case, we're not actually setting up new space on the stack. All we're doing is overwriting the space that we're currently using. So that completely prevents this explosion of stack use when we've got deep recursion going on. So this is the advantage of having a tail recursive function as long as our compiler or interpreter recognizes that it's tail recursive and says, ah, when, I'm, when I write the machine code for this particular function, instead of pushing new space on the stack, I'm just going to reuse the existing space on the stack. And this is the key idea of tail recursion. If you write your function so that it is tail recursive, and if you're using a compiler or an interpreter that recognizes tail recursion when it sees it, then you can eliminate a lot of the disadvantages that are usually associated with recursion. So this is the idea that we're going to rely on. All right, and so here I'm saying pretty much that exact same thing. So if we've got our stack frame and we're either not using tail recursion or we don't have a compiler that or interpreter that recognizes and optimizes for it, when we make a recursive call, we wind up pushing new space on top of the stack. If we've got a compiler that does recognize or interpreter that does recognize tail recursion and does optimize for it, then instead of adding new space, it just reuses the existing space. So that's the advantage that we're looking for. Now, it really, in this case, you do have to know if your compiler or if your interpreter is capable of doing optimization for tail recursion. So if you're using something like GCC or G++ as a compiler, you want to have a look at it and see, well, is there an optimization setting for it that recognizes and handles tail recursion. And in the case of GCC or G++, there is one, I can't remember what level it kicks in at. So if, I think if you use optimization level two or three, somewhere in there, the uh, tail recursion is recognized and handled. Okay, 
So, the example that we showed previously, that smallest example, it wasn't actually tail recursive. So, that, uh, that point in the cond where we said, if the front element is smaller than the result, smaller than the smallest thing in the rest, then return the front element. So, it was making a recursive call, right, seeing what was the smallest thing in the rest of the list. And after that call completed, we were saying, okay, well, is that smaller than this other thing? And if so, we'll return that. So we are doing a bunch of stuff after the recursive call before our return. So it wasn't a tail recursive function. So now we're going to try and rewrite it in a way that is tail recursive. And what we're going to do is add an extra parameter. So what we'll do is keep track of the smallest thing we've seen so far. So what we'll do is use a kind of a public smallest that's essentially just a wrapper to call this helper function. So our public version will say, okay, you give me a list. I'll do a quick error check and make sure that it really is a list. And as long as it's a list, then I'll call my helper function, pass it our list L, and say the smallest thing I've seen so far is our default, the most, the biggest possible integer. All right, so we'll assume that if nothing else happens, if we get no other answer, we'll use this as the smallest thing we've seen so far. So the way our small helper function will work is, again, it's taking a list and our best answer so far, if you like. So, so far is going to be the smallest thing we've seen to this point. And what we'll do is at each stage, we'll compare the front element of L to the smallest thing we've seen so far. And if the front element of L is smaller, then we'll use that as the new smallest thing we've seen so far. And if not, then we'll keep using the thing, the smallest thing that we've seen previously. So if L is empty, then we'll just say, well, the smallest thing I've seen so far was the, the, the final answer. If the front thing in L isn't an integer, then we'll ignore it and make a recursive call on the rest using the smallest thing that we've seen so far. If we get past that, then the thing in front is an integer. And so we'll say, okay, well, if the thing in front is smaller than the smallest thing we've seen so far, then the thing in front is our new smallest thing. So we'll make a recursive call and say, okay, well, let's look at the rest of the list and see if what's in there is smaller than the smallest thing so far. And our default will be just to say, okay, well, it's just, um, you know, the thing in front is bigger than the smallest thing we've seen so far. So let's just see if the smallest thing we've seen so, so far is smaller than everything else in the list. Now, for this, let's take a look and see if this is actually tail recursive, right? We look at the recursive calls. So for this recursive call, we're immediately returning whatever it returns. So that one's okay. For this recursive call, we're immediately returning whatever it returns. So that one's okay. And for this recursive call, we're immediately returning whatever it returns. So that one's okay. So we do actually have a tail recursive function. So if the compiler or interpreter recognizes tail recursion, then this one, when it runs, will be set up so that it doesn't use new stack space. It just keeps reusing the same stack space. So we've solved our space problem at the very least. And if we look at this in terms of efficiency, what we're doing is each pass, each recursive call eliminates one more element of L, right? Each recursive call is taking place on the tail of L. So the depth of recursion is at most the length of L. If we've got 20 elements in L, we're only making 20 recursive calls. So we know that we're going to get better efficiency. If I've got a list of 20 elements, I'm going to make it most 20 calls. So we've got much better efficiency than the other one. And we've also optimized away the use of the extra stack space. So we've got a much better solution here. This, uh, this idea of adding an extra parameter is quite common in developing a tail recursive solution. Uh, these are called accumulators because essentially what we're doing is accumulating a portion of the answer as we go through, right? We're accumulating our answer so far, if you like. So this is a very common approach to tail recursive solutions.
And I think here I'm just saying exactly what I just said. Now, the interesting thing is, if you've got an iterative solution to a problem, so if you've got a, a solution that's based on loops, it's guaranteed that you can transform that into a tail recursive solution. So, if you can do it with a loop, you can do it with tail recursion. So, we can always guarantee that we can come up with an, a solution that will run in time and space that's proportional to the loop-based approach. So this eliminates a lot of the arguments about uh, not using recursion. Now, the tail recursive solutions aren't always pretty, <laughs> but they can be done. So I just wanted to take a quick look at an idea for how you can take an iterative solution and turn it into a tail recursive solution. And essentially the idea is if we've got a loop, then what we want to do is replace each pass through the loop with one recursive call. Well, how do we wind up doing that? Well, ordinarily, for our iterative solution, we might have a bunch of variables that we're keeping track of as we're going through this. So since those things are changing over time, then for each recursive call, they could have different values. So what we'll do is for each of those variables, we'll add a matching parameter in our recursive solution. So those local variables become your accumulators. Whatever you initialize them to in your iterative solution is what you use as a default value for them in the tail recursive solution. And then for the actual body of the loop, what you're saying is, well, keep doing the loop while some condition is true, for instance. Well, we kind of turn that around for the recursive solution. We're going to say, okay, well, if this isn't true, then we're finished. So if I'm saying keep doing it while y is less than x, then I'm going to say if y is greater than or equal to x, bail out and return whatever I would have returned from the iterative solution. And then the body of the loop essentially becomes the general case for our recursion. If I've got some actions that I'm doing, I'm going to do them in the body, if you like, of my recursive solution. And if I'm making changes to those local variables in the loop, then what I'm going to do is say, well, to change that value in the loop, what I want to do in the recursive call is change it in the, well, I want to change it, change its value as a parameter in the recursive call. So instead of saying, well, let's uh, add one to y as this local variable, I'm saying, well, make a recursive call with a value of y that's one bigger. So we can go through and do a straight transformation of our loop, our iterative solution, into a tail recursive solution. Now, again, if you've got 50 local variables, you're going to wind up with 50 parameters in the tail recursive version. But, uh, but the structure is relatively straightforward, and it can be done. All right, so I will leave the ideas of tail recursion and the efficiency issues associated with it there for now. Um, we will try and do a number of examples over the, the course of the, the next few weeks where we take advantage of this, where we say, okay, well, if we're going to do a solution, let's do a tail recursive one. All right, that's it for now.